clients. You're supposed to ask people nicely to do something, and if you don't ask them nicely, if you don't ask them nicely and they obey it, they have to go get therapy later. But if you do ask them nicely and and they do it, then that means that they got to choose whether they wanted to do it and they didn't have to suffer any consequences if they didn't do it. And if you don't ask them nicely and they refuse, they're actually the heroes because they're speaking truth to power. That's how our culture is. And the more I thought about it, the more I started thinking about every situation I can see in our culture, people are always asking people nicely to do things, whether it's at work or wherever it is. And then I caught myself doing it. Gregory, do you want to do this? Would you like that? Evelyn, do you think maybe you could? Wait a minute, I thought. I need to get back to, we need to get back to the old paths where you give a command. All right? That's the old paths. You remember uh, um, Jeremiah said, Stand ye in the way and seek and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk ye in it and ye shall find rest for your souls. And uh, what was Jeremiah calling the old paths? Well, it was the Ten Commandments that were given on Mount Sinai. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. So we are to obey God's commands. And the Bible does not simply say that we only obey God's commands. There are four areas of authority that God has delegated his authority to in this world. And he tells us to obey their commands. My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. It says, uh, to wives, be obedient to your own husbands. It says, uh, to servants, obey your masters. Obey them that have, you know, it says, it talks about uh, leaders in church. It says, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Um, and it says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every ordinance of man, whether it be the king or to governors sent by him. And so we see that the Bible does not just simply say that God gives commands, but the Bible specifically commands us to obey the commands of the four areas of authority that is what God has ordained, which is, first of all, it's the home, then it's the workplace, then it is, that's the order they're given in the Bible, because the workplace was when God told Adam, by the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, all right, and he gave people private property, which is the foundation, which is the whole idea of thou shalt not steal, is that each person has a right to private property, which our Constitution recognizes as well. Um, and so God ordained uh, the home first, and then he ordained private property um, and, the, and, and the workplace, because the workplace is part of that. Um, Cardinal Glass owns that property, and they own us while we're there working. Um, I just use that example because that's where I work. When I worked at Culver's, it was the same way. I had to obey the, the rules of Culver's. Um, and then um, also he ordained the government, which is in, um, in, in um, excuse me, yeah, that's in... Um, Genesis 9, um, and where he said, Whoso sheddest man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. The government is there to uh, punish those who kill and to protect us from each other, from hurting one another. Um, and then also in, um, in the New Testament, God ordained the church. Jesus said, I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And the same command about submission to authority is given for the church as well. And so we are to not only obey God's commands, but obey the people that God has placed in authority over us. Uh, of course, uh, as we need to uh, mention, when the governing authorities told Peter and John uh, not to speak anymore in this name, they said, don't speak Jesus' name, don't preach the name of Jesus, uh, they said we ought to obey God rather than men. So God is always the highest authority, so anytime one of those four areas of authority commands you to do something that goes against God's command, you always obey the higher authority. But as long as they're not telling you to do something that goes against God's command, you are to obey that governing authority. Now, we know that. I've preached on that many times, talked about it. But we have gotten away from the idea of obeying commands. Um, and so uh, I thought about this, and I was uh, thinking about how the fact that Jesus said... Um, to, to us as a, as a church, to God's people, he said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. That's when we pass out tracts and we share the gospel and we tell people how to be saved and people are saved. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. And then he says the next step is this, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. The next step is for people to be scripturally baptized as a picture of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and their own death and burial and resurrection, spiritually speaking, when they were saved from their sins. And then he says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have politely asked you to do. Oh, that's not what he said. That might be, I don't know how other versions say it, but I know what it actually says is teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have 
commanded you. And so, Jesus Christ commands me to command you to obey his commands. And I thought about that, and I thought, well, I, I, you know, I do teach people God's commandments after they're saved. I do have a Bible study I go through with people, and we talk about some of the basics of the Christian life. They call, that Bible study I do is called God's Will for My Life, where we talk about the basics of the Christian life, basic teachings of the Bible, how God wants you to live. It'll help you stay out of trouble. I have that Bible study. I go through that with new believers. But then I thought to myself, and I also preached you know, that message back when we had our baptism Sunday last year, read the red letters where I encouraged, and I even gave Rob a red-letter Bible. Of course, you know, you can read the commands of Christ in, in, in black ink. That's okay, too. But I gave him a red-letter Bible just because I thought, well, I knew that TJ had a red-letter Bible, but I didn't know if he did, and so I gave him one. Um, and uh, and uh, that message, of course, is not saying you have to read the red letters, but it's saying you need to read the, the commands of Jesus Christ because that's what he said. It's the last thing he said before he left teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And so we need to be reading Jesus' commands. Of course, we also know something, don't we, about the commands of Jesus Christ. He said, whoever hears these sayings of mine and doeth them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And we go, well, so what? Well, both of them had storms, didn't they? And the winds, and the rains came and the winds blew and the floods came and what happened the, the one they both had storms but the one that survived was the one that was obeying the commands of jesus christ and so now we see it's kind of important to obey jesus commands we can blow it up oh there's a very popular word nowadays those of you know me well know i do not like this word they're very popular word nowadays, the word legalistic and if you if you talk too much about the bible says you should do this and the bible says you well you're, you're you're so legalistic well Jesus said to obey his commands. So I guess Jesus is legalistic. Um, and then, of course, people try to get away around by it, saying, no, no, we're talking about when Jesus, when you give a command that isn't in the Bible. Well, that's different. That's not legalistic. That's being a Pharisee and adding to God's word, and we ought not to do that. We should never give someone a command and say, God commands you to do this if the Bible doesn't say that you have to do that. We can say this is my opinion, or this is how I want to do things in this church, or this is how we do things in our family. These are our family rules, but we should never say this is God's rule if it's not in the Bible. So that's the difference there. Um, but uh, nowadays, it isn't popular to talk about commands and God's commands, but we need to read the commands of Christ and we need to obey them for really one simple reason because it's the reason Jesus gave and that is that when we get into the storms of life our faith and our testimony and our walk with the Lord will survive that storm I preached a message on that called right after my sister Tanya passed away called surviving the storms of life we will survive the storms if we're obeying before the storms listen before the storms you're not going to be able to go and oh now I have a storm oh maybe I need to go back and find out when Jesus is too late then you won't be prepared. You have to do it. The wise man can't go, oh, can I go get someone to get a crane and pick up my house from the sand quickly in the rain and the storm? Quick, the floods are coming quick, fast, higher, higher, and set it on top of a rock. You're not going to do that with your house, are you? You have to build the house on the rock before the storms hit, which means right now, today, March 12th, 2023, we need to start obeying Jesus today. Amen. That's what we got to do. So, as we talk about the commands of Jesus, the place where most of his commands are found is in the Sermon on the Mount. There are more, but the, the, the main place, and certainly the beginning of his commands in the New Testament, is in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. And he starts out in this sermon talking about how to be happy. This is interesting. How, this is what will make you happy. And he says, blessed. Blessed, blessed. He talks about people who are blessed or, and that word blessed actually means to be happy. And uh, so we are talking about that. We're talking about the secret of happiness. And I've said this before, and I know I'm repetitious, but you know that you need to hear this every week. You know you do, and I know you do, and I know I do need to hear this every week because we don't know what will make us happy. And we grew up in a culture that tells us this will make you happy. But we've spent our lives chasing after those things, and they are not making us happy. We're not happier now because we follow those things. And so it's time to put away what the culture tells us make, her happy, make us happy. Also, put away what your heart tells you will make you happy. <laughs> and read the Word of God and do what He says make you happy. And I promise you, if God created the world and raised Jesus from the dead, He probably knows better than you and better than me what will make you happy maybe you should stop struggling maybe I should stop struggling to believe 
that that will make me happy. And maybe I should just decide, I'm just gonna do it. I'm just going to do it. And we will all fail, and there's forgiveness. And we are gonna be patient with each other when we fail. Because tomorrow, I'm gonna fail, so I'm gonna be patient with you today when you fail, amen? amen. But we still need to make it our goal to obey the commands of Christ. And Jesus even covers what we should do when we fail. He even gives us instruction for that because he never thought that his disciples or that any of us were going to be perfect to do everything perfectly. That's not the problem. The problem is when we stop teaching it as commands and we start making it optional and then pretty soon we stop even teaching it altogether. That's where the problem lies, not when we fail because we are all going to fail. So in this passage, uh, verses 3 through 12 describes the secret of happiness. And so, uh, as I've been doing, and I don't do this every time, but as I've been doing in this series, I, I want us to really get these beatitudes, which, of course, the word beatitude is Latin beatitudo, and it means a state of happiness. All right? And so, um, we're going to read these out loud together, and this will help us to really get them into our minds. And so, please stand out of respect for the Word of God. And if you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12. Let's read it out loud together. Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you, and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, I pray that you fill me with your spirit now as I teach. Father, I know that my words are not infallible, only your words are. But I do believe that the Bible says that God uses gifts in the body of Christ to edify the body. And I pray, Father, that you would fill me with your spirit now and guide my words so that your Holy Spirit can apply your truth to your people. And that we would go away strengthened, encouraged, and edified to face whatever we have coming up this next week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, this week we are talking about blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. Just a quick recap. A person who is poor in spirit is a person who knows that they need God. They have To be poor in spirit is to have spiritual needs. And that person, the Bible says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You cannot be saved unless you know that you need salvation, unless you know that you need forgiveness of sin. But also, he was talking to his disciples who were also saved, and he was saying, you need to live your entire life in humility and dependence on God. And that's I talked about that. You're not going to come to church, you're not going to read your Bible, unless you think that you need something. Okay, so if you're poor in spirit, you'll come to church. If you're poor in spirit, you read your Bible. You will, if you're poor in spirit, you'll pray because you'll have a few areas of your life that you want God to help you with. Um, hopefully every area of your life you want God to help you with. And so being poor in spirit is so important. That's why Jesus began with that. Then he said, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And that's confusing to us because how can you say happy are those who are sad? I mean, that's literally what blessed are they that mourn is. And he's saying, well, for they shall be comforted. It's because they're going to receive comfort. And so we talked about, we found out that in the Garden of Eden, that God actually is the one who brought sorrow. They experienced um, uh, no, uh, shame at first, and then they experienced fear, and then they responded in blame. But God said, now you're going to have sorrow. But that sorrow actually brought them to repentance, and that sorrow actually helped them to come back into fellowship with God. And then now, listen, someday we all go through sorrow our whole lives, and someday we're going to get to heaven. And we're going to be comforted after we went to that sorrow. But we're going to see how that sorrow, you know, you look at the book of Revelation, there's a lot of sorrow there, isn't there? All sent by God, right? But you see that how in heaven there's going to be no more sorrow. God's going to comfort us because now sorrow did its work in our lives where it showed us the damaging effects of sin and it brought us to repentance. 
And now we can appreciate the salvation that we are being offered in Jesus Christ. Blessed are they that mourn. And then blessed are the meek, um, for they shall inherit the earth. And uh, what a great testimony, a reminder that, um, that uh, David was meek, and he ended up becoming the king of Israel, um, even though he was not fighting for that position, not trying to get that position. And we talked about what it means to be meek, is to, to not to fret about evildoers, and not to be envious against the workers of iniquity, and to rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. It says, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. God promises to take care of you if you trust in him, and you be patient with uh, the things that are going on in your life. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And then, and of course, Jesus came into Jerusalem, and he was meek and lowly and riding upon a donkey. And then we talked about last week, Best, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. We went to Psalm 32, and we talked about how miserable David was for that year that he was not in fellowship with God. He was so miserable because he didn't have that hunger and thirst after righteousness. But when Nathan came and said, Thou art the man, and confronted his sin, and he said, I have sinned against the Lord. And then he describes his the joy and the turnaround in his life when he... Turned, he said, I, I, I acknowledge my sin. And he said, and I didn't hide my sin anymore. And he said, for this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. And he talks about rejoice, and, and, and rejoice all ye upright in heart. And he talked about the joy of having your sins forgiven. And I talked about how we need to learn how to do that to see the ne negative effects of sin and see how wonderful it is to be in fellowship with God and then have that con constant hunger and thirst after righteousness and you know what happens? We get filled. And uh, uh, you know, what is the opposite? If you don't have a hunger and thirst after righteousness, you'll be empty. You'll be empty. But those who have a hunger and thirst after righteousness, they will be filled. So fulfillment is not found in pleasure. It's found in righteousness. Righteousness that begins with confession of sin and then continues with the Holy Spirit giving you the power to overcome sin and to walk in fellowship with God. There is nothing better than that that will make you truly happy. Pleasure will not make you happy, but righteousness will make you happy. And so we come to blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And this is one of those I've been struggling with all week. I told you, I don't like these. I don't like preaching this series because, um, you know, I, I normally don't do this on Sunday mornings. I do this on Thursday nights, and, and, and sometimes I preach a series um, during Sunday school, but... Um, I kind of just take one thought and then I preach it and I do that based on what I believe the Lord wants me to preach. I have a long, long list of, of, of ideas, uh, different ideas. I feel that the Lord's given me insights into scripture and I just kind of have them on a list on my phone and I just pray over that list and pick different things out and most of them I never preach on. I, I probably have 200, 250 sermon ideas on my phone and I don't preach all of them but I, they're just kind of there, just thoughts I have throughout the week when I'm listening to scripture or or whatever, um, just that come to me, and uh, different studies that I do, uh, or even sometimes in prayer time, the Lord will give me uh, sermon ideas, and uh, so uh, normally I don't do this, but this is something I felt like the Lord wanted me to do, and that on a Sunday morning I should preach the commands of Jesus Christ, and so yeah, this one I was struggling with as well this week, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy, and uh, it was different, it's a different kind of struggle from the hunger and thirst after righteousness struggle that I felt was difficult, because I felt it's so difficult when you have a hunger and thirst after righteousness and there's so many people you see have don't, don't have that hunger. And it's hard to know, like, how do you help them to be hungry for righteousness? They seem to have hunger for everything else. But this was a little different. And I know why it was difficult. It's difficult in a different way. Because what are we all taught growing up in church and what are we taught our entire lives about God and God's love? And it's true, but sometimes... We draw conclusions from that truth that's not true. And it's the one thing we all grow up hearing being taught, and what is this? God loves everyone unconditionally. And it's true, isn't it? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's unconditional love. We know that God, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Look at that. I mean, God wants, wanted Hitler to be saved. I mean, it's amazing. God wanted Bin Laden to be saved. God, wanted, uh, God wants Joe Biden to be saved. That's amazing. God wanted you to be saved. That's amazing. God wanted me to be saved. That's amazing. God's love is unconditional. But listen, God's love is unconditional, but his blessings are not. 
And you know exactly what I'm talking about because if you are even somewhere halfway decent of a parent, you're the same way. You love your children unconditionally, but you don't bless them unconditionally. We have a name for people who bless their children unconditionally, and we call them bad parents. We say they're, they're spoiling their kids. Why? Because they're blessing them unconditionally, irrespective or irregardless of what, whether or not that person is what they're doing. And so when children experience blessings, no matter what they do, their behavior becomes worse and worse because they have no motive to behave because they're going to be blessed no matter what they do. And we can see that with our government, right? There's so much corruption in government because people don't have a motive. They literally get elected for lying. Right? We're voting for the person who tells the biggest lie. right? And not only that, but we vote for the person who sends us the most free stuff. But then the free stuff is sent to us whether or not we behave. right? So even though we're actually not even trying to get a job or work or, be, or have character, we still get a check from the government. I'm not saying we, every person here, but I'm saying in general in our culture. And so what we see is when the government blesses the citizens unconditionally, the character of the citizens goes down immeasurably because there's no connection between their behavior and the consequences. And that's true with children. It's true with, with, with uh, people in the workplace, you know? Everyone who's ever worked anywhere has seen employees that fool around. But if that employee that's fooling around not working hard, and that other employee is working hard, and if they both get the same pay paycheck and there's no consequences for fooling around, you know what happens? Over the years, you'll have more and more and more and more employees that are fooling around and not doing their job. And so, and then you have more and more resentment on the part of people who are working hard because other people aren't. So the more work comes on them, you can see how that works, right? And so, yeah, we are, everybody's nodding their head. We all, we all experience this. I see it every day, okay? Um, and so, I think we all understand this principle, don't we? Blessings cannot be unconditional. Because if blessings are unconditional, then behavior does not change. Behavior and character does not improve if blessings are unconditional. So, you love your children unconditionally, and that's good. I hope you do. Like, no matter what happens, no matter what they ever do in their life, you will always love them. That's wonderful. But you don't bless your children unconditionally. You should bless them based on their behavior. So they'll have positive things happen to them if they are being obedient and responsible, and if they're being disobedient and irresponsible, things will go negative for them. And so, but you see, though, how we have gotten that confused in our mind when it comes to God. Where we grew up being taught, God's love is unconditional. God loves you unconditional no matter what. And now we have churches filled with people who want to be told it's all unconditional. God loves you no matter what you do. So it doesn't matter what you do. We all fail. It doesn't matter. And then the behavior gets worse and worse and worse. And then we just keep repeating this phrase that God loves you all. God loves you all. God loves you all. You remember um, we've been talking about churches in our area that are voting to leave their denomination because of the LGBT issue. And you might stop and think, how? I mean, have you ever seen some of these? <laughs> There's a, there are some, um, there are some um, uh, Twitter accounts. Maybe, maybe some, you know, you probably heard of the, the libs of TikTok that's like a, what is that, like a TikTok? Oh, I'm, I'm not on TikTok, but you see the clips other places. Yeah. Libs of TikTok is a, <coughs> Excuse me. It's um, they just show clips of liberals saying ridiculous things, and they actually got uh, banned because they're literally showing what liberals actually believe and say. <laughs> and then they didn't like that, because, and so they actually banned them. Um, and uh, uh, so you have those, but there's another one called woke preacher clips. Okay, so so there's people. There's one called bad sermon clips, and there's people who don't like different kinds of preachers, and so they'll take do a clip of what they think. That, is something bad that that preacher said. Uh, fortunately, I'm not famous enough to end up on bad preacher clips yet, although now that I'm live streaming so much, I wouldn't be surprised if it happened at some point. And then you'd be like, my pastor's famous. Everybody thinks he's an idiot. But anyway, um, uh, uh, there's one called Woke Preacher Clips. And that is literally just a person goes and finds the most liberal churches that are in these LGBTQ-friendly denomination stuff, and they find just utterly absurd things and it's almost always, I've noticed, well, usually it's a woman pastor, but sometimes it's a man, and usually they always have like a rainbow, you know, you, so you know like the, is it called a stole? Those of you that 
Or is that the, there's the tunic, the, it, it, the thing that goes over their neck, is that called a stole? I'm just so bad, I'm just such a, a uh, yeah, no, it's not a scarf. <laughs> it's not, I think they would be mortified if you called it a scarf, but you grew up Baptist, what would you know? So, <laughs> so, anyway, I'm so unfamiliar with all of that, but I think it's called a stole. There, there's like a, uh, it's like a sash that comes up and goes around. Yeah, and, and then usually, usually, you know, like in a tradition, those of you who grew up like Lutheran or um, Anglican or, or United Methodist, they usually, it'll have like a dove on it or like a yeah. cross, right? You know, and it's kind of like, it, they kind of look like they're, in my opinion, you know, some people say, well, they're, they're, they're wearing pajamas and they got their collar on backwards and they make fun of it because pastor, because Baptists think it's kind of silly. Um, but uh, uh, to me, it almost looks like they're dressed up for a play, you know? It's like every, every week we, we have like a little production play that we put on or whatever. But yeah, I'm not, you know, God looks on the heart, so it's not a big deal to me how they're dressed. It might, might be my opinion, and who knows? Maybe, maybe those guys are way better Christians than I am, so I don't want to criticize them. You're going to wear but, a robe in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> well, my wife just told me I'm going to wear a robe in heaven, so I better be careful what I say. So, okay, I'm like, wait, you have to wear that thing? No, and there's a rainbow around the throne. Oh, no, no, I didn't even say that. Um, so, anyway, but they usually have, instead of those traditional ones, you know, they have the, like, the collar with the little white little white call like that, a lot of Catholic priests have. But then usually they have like that stole, and I think that's what it's called. Instead of it having, a, a, you know, some kind of religious symbol, it's, it's rainbow. It's rainbow and it's like, I'm pro-LGBT. But that's not just it. If you, if you listen to the speeches, like the, the sermons that they give, where they're trying to defend how LGBT is fine, <coughs> a lot of times they are LGBT. They'll almost always talk about God's love. God loves everyone unconditionally. So how dare you say this is wrong, this is right. Now I want you to listen. You'd be like, how in the world can you read Romans chapter 1, right? How in the world can you read Leviticus? How in the world can you read about Sodom and Gomorrah and come away going, you just, the whole message of all that is we're just supposed to love those people and they're no different than us and it's all fine. How in the world could you come to that we, we sit there and we go, how? And I want to tell you how and it can happen to us. And here's how. It's when you get that whole thing confused where you think that God's unconditional love means that his blessings are also unconditional. If you get that confused, listen, today you could be an independent, fundamental, temperamental, what do they say? Um, <laughs> I'm not good at saying that. Um, dispensational, no, yeah, there's another one. Um, premillennial, independent, fundamental, premillennial, temperamental, you know, old fashioned Baptist churches that believe the Bible, you could be in a church like that today. Listen to me. Don't hey, listen. Don't tune me out. Twenty years from now, you could be in one of those churches with with those guys with the with the rainbow. You could. You could. And here's how. All you have to do. All you have to do. I'm not saying you will. I'm saying you could. Now listen. Okay, here, I'll, here, I'll, I'll give you an example. I understand. I'm confusing you. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Remember, if you disagree with the pastor, talk about it afterward. But I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. I'll give, I'll give, I'll give you an example. Okay. Could you fall off of a cliff? Could you physically fall off a cliff? Yeah. But only if you go close to the cliff. Right. But because you're not planning on going anywhere near a cliff, it won't happen to you, right? But when I say you could, I mean, Michael, if you weren't careful and you decided to go stand on the edge of a cliff and wave your arms and go, look at me, I'm a birdie, you could fall off the cliff. <laughs> but you're not going to. <laughs> you're not going to. So that's what I mean by could. Does that make sense? Okay, I want to tell you where the cliff is. Listen, I'm helping you stay away from that cliff. You know where the cliff is? The cliff where people fall off into. Welcome to everyone this morning. God loves you just the way you are. We're just here to talk about love. Next week's about love. We got that's about love. Love, 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 love. God loves you unconditionally. Doesn't matter. We just need to love each other. I think we'll be fine. God, God loves everyone except unborn babies. Basically, yeah. is what they're saying. God doesn't love them, evidently, because he's really fine with them getting tear limb from limb, but everyone else, God loves them, right? But anyway, but that cliff is, God loves everyone unconditionally, no matter what, and he blesses them unconditionally. That God's blessings are unconditional. When you cross over from God loves everyone unconditionally to he blesses them unconditionally, that is where now anything can become okay in your mind. Does that make sense? And that's what I'm trying to help you with and me with today. Now, <clears throat> this passage is interesting. It says, blessed are the merciful, for they 
shall obtain mercy. Mercy is not unconditional. It's for the merciful. It says it right here. But it doesn't say that they're going to obtain love. It says they're going to obtain mercy. So listen, God loves every single person in the world, but he does not give mercy to people who are not merciful. That's why I was struggling with the sermon this week. Because as I was thinking about the sermon and praying about how to apply it to your life, I mean, I don't have any trouble understanding what it's saying, but I'm praying out how do I apply it to you? I need the Holy Spirit to show me how does this apply to me and to you? And the application is this, and it's sad. But every one of us here, because we have a sin nature, we want God to give us unconditional mercy. We want mercy whether or not we are merciful. And Jesus said in his commands in the Sermon on the Mount, if you want mercy, you have to be merciful or you will not get mercy. And this is New Testament, folks. You know, people always say, well, the Old Testament God is a God of judgment, and now Jesus came and died for us. Now we can all do whatever we want. It doesn't matter. We get mercy. We get a free ticket to heaven. Everything's fine and wonderful. Well, yes, if you're saved, you get an absolutely free ticket to heaven, just like if you're born into my family, you have a free ticket to be my child, but it also means <laughs> that there are going to be consequences if you do not obey me because you are born into my family. You came in for free, but you don't get away with behavior scot-free, do you? But you came into the family for free. And so in our sin nature, and we are all this way, the man standing here preaching right now, I am just like you. When somebody else does something wrong, I want to go, you are doing wrong. And here's all the things wrong you're doing. And I'm going to tell you you're wrong. And if you don't shape up, you're going to be in big trouble because you're doing wrong. I'm talking about what my sin nature wants to do. I'm not saying I always do that. I'm saying that's our sin nature. And then we turn right around and do I ever do wrong things? Don't ask my wife. <laughs> We all stumble in many ways. The Bible says, so you do wrong things too. I do wrong things too. But what do I do when I do something wrong? I ask for mercy. That's what I do. I want mercy. And that is my problem. And that is your problem. And that is that God says, I will not give you, Mark Hunter, I will not give you mercy unless you show other people mercy. That is a statement in the Bible that God teaches us, and it is amazing how we miss that because we're so focused on God's unconditional love. Oh, God loves us unconditionally. God's love is unconditional. His blessings are not, and today we're talking about the blessing of mercy. I don't know about you, but I need God's mercy every day. That's why we love the verse. God's mercies are new every morning because we want it for ourselves. But we will not get it unless we show other people mercy. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 18. We just talked about this, but we need to look at it because of our text today. Matthew chapter 18. Here's a really good example of the New Testament teaching that God's mercy is conditional. It is conditional on us showing other people mercy mercy. And listen, <clears throat> you cannot afford to live for one minute without God's mercy. Because mercy is not getting what you deserve. You know, one person has said it this way, <clears throat> mercy is not getting what you deserve, grace is getting what you don't deserve, right? So grace is, the word grace actually means gift. So like when, uh, on your birthday, somebody gives you a gift, that's grace. It's just a free gift, they just give you something that you didn't earn. Right? It's undeserved. They just, just gave you a gift. Um, but mercy is you get pulled over by the cop and you were speeding and he tells you, he lets you off with a warning. Now, he gave you mercy. And I can tell you, we all need mercy. And so we have to give other people mercy. Now, the exception to that, to this, is if you are in authority 
you have to make sure that you administer justice. Now, this is the difference, okay? <clears throat> Just so you understand, so we be clear on what we're trying to say here. <clears throat> if you are um, a parent, if all you do is just show your children mercy every time they do something wrong, then they'll never do right. Because they'll just go, mercy! They go, oh, yeah, I need to be merciful so I can get mercy. So now you let your kids off the hook. No. See, in that situation, it's something different. You're their authority. So when you're the authority in a certain... In a position of authority, you actually need to enforce the rules, enforce the law. If you don't, there'll be chaos in your home. If you were a policeman, yes, you might let uh, a person off with a warning... And then you might let another person off with a warning. But if no matter how many times any one scissor does wrong, you let them all off with a warning, now they're all like, oh, I'll get us a warning. <laughs> right? That's what's going to happen. So you actually do have to enforce the law. There has to be justice. So if you are in authority over someone else, you need to be just. You don't just show mercy. You do need to be just. Okay. But now we're not talking about if you are the authority, because as you know from Matthew 18, this passage is that person didn't act was not actually in authority over the other person. In this situation, that person had received mercy, and now they refused to give it to someone else. Okay. So that's where we are all in a position of as Christians is we have all received mercy when we had our sins forgiven, and after we were saved, chances are after you were saved you sinned once or twice. That probably happened. It may be rare, but it's <laughs> probably a lot more frequent than you know. And God gave you mercy then, too. You asked forgiveness, he gave you mercy. Sometimes he gave you consequences because you needed to learn a lesson, but a lot of times he just gave you mercy. But listen, but now you're going to run into, you may, you may end up marrying someone who could occasionally sin. That is possible. Um, you may have children that do occasionally sin. You may have friends and relatives, and you could attend a church that has sinners in it. That is theoretically possible. It's hard to picture, but it's theoretically possible. And so just like you receive mercy from God, you got to show mercy to other people. That is part of um, our calling as Christians. So I'll read the passage. Verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But forasmuch as he had not to pay, his lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. Now you understand, what he was doing was not wrong, what this lord was doing. The guy owed him ten million dollars. Ten ten thousand talents is technically about nine point six million. I just rounded up to ten because I'm not sure it would make a difference to you if you owed ten million or nine point six. All right. So um, anyway, he owed him uh, about ten million dollars um, is the equivalent of what ten thousand talents of I think gold is. But but uh, so he he said okay well you got to pay it back. So he had him he had the person had to be sold to slavery and then the money would go to try to pay back everything that he owned to, to for uh, for the payment. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, which to means to bow down, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Now, he actually couldn't pay. But what do you say when the creditors come? Give me one more week, <laughs> even though you know a week or not. But you don't want to get kicked out of your house, so you keep begging for more time. I mean, that's normal. What else would you do? Yeah, kick me out. I deserve it. Hey, I got my bags packed already. Right? You're going to keep begging for mercy. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Now, Jesus doesn't cover in this passage why he forgave him. We know why God forgives us. It's because Jesus was punished in our place. Okay? So there was still justice. The payment was still made. Someone else made the payment. In this passage, though, Jesus is focusing on something different. Not how the payment was made, but the fact that the person was forgiven, and then they refused to forgive someone else. Does that make sense? So Jesus is not focusing on the justice part. He's focusing on the you have to be merciful to receive mercy part. That's the aspect that Jesus is teaching. Here. But the same servant went out. Oh, I can't believe this. This guy is crazy. He's terrible. Hey, have you ever struggled to forgive someone who wronged you? Yeah. Have I ever struggled to forgive someone who wronged me? Yeah. So I want you to know something. Jesus, when he says this same servant, he was forgiven $10 million, and now he goes and finds someone else. Oh! <gasps> Don't pretend to be so shocked you've done this. Don't pretend to be so shocked I've done this. 
we have all done this. Jesus is not describing some hypothetical, shocking situation so that we can all be horrified at what a terrible person he is. Jesus is telling us <clears throat> that we struggle with this every day because we have all been forgiven. Something unbelievable, which is all the sins we have ever committed in word and thought and deed all of our lives, horrible stuff that we don't want anyone else to know about. <laughs> But yet, we, somebody does something to us, and we are so angry, we are get so upset at the person. We all do this, folks. Jesus is not describing some hypothetical situation of some really, really bad person. He's describing you and me, because we all struggle with forgiveness. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him 100 pence. And if you look at the equivalents of this, and there's different ways to look at it, but it was, it was $9.6 million to $16, basically, is the equivalent. Laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me at that post. And that's the way we are. It's not right. It's not right that that person did that to me. It's not right that they said that. It's not right that they borrowed that and wouldn't return it. It's not right that they said that mean thing about me to someone else. It's not right that they stole that or took that. It's not right that they uh, did that immorality or whatever it is. And we look at someone else and we're like, that's not right. But what are we forgetting? How much God has forgiven us. We're forgetting that part when we focus on that. And we do. We That's what we're doing. We're like, man, I can't believe. When you say I can't believe so and so did such and such, <laughs> you know really what you're doing is you're grabbing them by the throat. That's, that's what you're doing. That's what I'm doing when I say, I can't, I can't believe it. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. You notice how this, the wording is the same? You know why? Because that person who did the wrong thing, listen, they can't go back and change it. They can't go back and fix it. Just like you couldn't go back and fix all the things you did. You just had to ask for mercy from God. And so, there's really no way for them to pay you, so they're just saying, have patience and I'll pay you, just like you said to God, have patience and I'll pay you. But really, you could never have paid, so God just had to forgive you and take it all and put it on Jesus Christ. And listen, because you've been forgiven that much, God commands you, yes, commands you, to look at that other person the same way and say, I've been forgiven. Now I forgive that person. Pay me that thou owest. But he would not. But he went and cast him into prison until he should pay the debt. Again, if you just look at what that servant did, the fact that he owed him money and he didn't pay him back and he's never going to probably be able to pay him back, well, I'm going to cast you to prison until you pay it. And I don't know how he was going to pay it by being in prison. That's not clear in the parable, but either way he was trying to get him to pay it. Okay? But all I'm trying to say is, or maybe like he would have friends and relatives that would go try to raise the money to get him out of prison. I'm not sure. That's not clear. It's the, the parable is just an illustration of a spiritual truth. They're right. He's the point is you have to pay it back, but he can't pay it back. But you have to pay it back. But he can't pay it back. But you have to pay it back. But you can't pay it back. Now listen to me very carefully. All your life. People are going to do things to you and do things to others and do things and they can never go back and fix it and take it and pay it back. And in that moment, when that person says, have patience with me and I will pay thee all, just like what you said to God, maybe I can work my way to heaven. Have patience, God. I'm going to be a good person next year, Santa Claus. Next year. It's going to be the year I'll be a good person. And God says, no, you won't. You can't. My son's going to die in your place. And you're just going to be forgiven if you receive it as a free gift. And God wants you to look at that person that either wronged you or you're just upset about because of things that they've done. And God wants you to look at it. And again, it is not referring to if you're in their position of authority. If you are in a position of government authority, you are to administer justice. If you're in a position of parental authority, you administer justice. 
if you're in a position of authority in a company, you administer justice. You don't go, yeah, you can all just steal everything and come late every day and I'll never fire you, right? No, you can't, because I just love mercy, because I want to be merciful. I want someone to be merciful to me, so I just, no, no. Position of authority, you have to administer justice, and even me as a pastor. And I know you don't want me to do this as a pastor. You don't want me to say, you know what, we all love, get out the rainbow. <laughs> if we all just love each other, it'll be fine. And we, God loves everyone, and this week we're going to talk about love next week. Guess what we're going to talk about this week? Love. You guess it. Week three. Guess what we're going to talk about this week? Love. It's amazing. And if you don't like, you don't believe in love, then you can leave our denomination and we'll label you as the hate denomination because you left our love denomination. No, no, no. You know that you don't want me to become this kind of a pastor where I basically say everything goes and anything anybody does is all fine. It doesn't matter. No, I'm an absent authority. And I have to make sure there's justice. I have to make sure there's like, okay, if I do something that causes a problem for someone else, I need to ask forgiveness. If you do something that causes a problem for someone else, you need to ask forgiveness. And as we've talked about, everything needs to be done decently and in order, right? We need that, okay? So I'm not talking about if you're in a position of authority over the person. I'm talking about just the simple fact that in most of these cases where we struggle to show people mercy, we're not in authority over them. And that's part of the reason why we're so mad. Because we can't control them. We can't change them. Really, all we can do is stop and go, did I get mercy from God? I'm going to show this person mercy. That's really all we can do. That's really only option. Either that or be angry and bitter at them, grab them by the throat, put them in jail, which is a metaphor for you're saying, I am not going to be nice to you anymore because I have decided that you're a bad person, which is what our culture and our society is so good at today. That person is a bad person. We don't show mercy. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that, that was done. Then his Lord, after they had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant. You know, we don't think about that, but God says, if I won't offer mercy to someone else after I've been forgiven, I'm wicked. He didn't call the person who had done the wrong wicked. He called him wicked because of what he'd been forgiven. Oh, thou wicked servant. I forgave thee all that debt because thou desiredest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? I looked it up. The Greek word that's translated compassion and pity here is the same as the word where Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. It's the same word. Because compassion and pity are synonyms for mercy. It's the same, same idea. To have compassion on someone, to care about them, and to decide that you are not going to give them what they deserve. Because God did not give you what you deserve. And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. And this is interesting. So what happened in the situation, his Lord, the one that forgave him the 10,000 talents, the $10 million dollars, he got angry with him and he delivered him to tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. Now this is a parable. But then Jesus explains his own parable. I always say this. You need to pay attention to when Jesus explains his own parable. Very often people preach an entire message on a parable and they won't read Jesus' explanation. And I always go, don't you think Jesus knew what he meant by his own parable? <laughs> so Jesus tells you what he meant by the parable. Why don't you preach out of the explanation instead of the parable and what you think the parable means? Because, like, literally the explanation is right there. Now, it's not always true. Sometimes a parable is to taught and there is no explanation given by Jesus. Um, and in that situation, you just have to go by the rest of the Bible and what you know to be true in the rest of the Bible to make sure your understanding of the parable is correct. But in many cases, Jesus explains his own parable. So just in case we missed it, listen, remember, God's love is unconditional, but his blessings are not unconditional. Mercy is not unconditional. Love is. He loves everyone equally. He wants everyone to be saved. He offers salvation freely to everyone. But listen, his mercy is not unconditional. So look at verse 35. So likewise. All right. Jesus said, did you hear the parable I just told? Now he says, likewise. Shall my heavenly Father do also unto you? Whew. How is that in the New Testament? 
Somebody made a mistake. Shouldn't they have put that in the Old Testament? Isn't the Old Testament... Isn't the Old Testament God the angry dictator that sends you to the torture chamber? Delivered him to the tormentors. What? Okay. You know who the tormentors are. That's the devil. That's the tormentors. The Bible says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. God actually allows us to choose whether we're going to surrender or submit to him every day or whether we're going to be under the devil's authority. God lets you choose that. Now, is God not under authority when he delivers you over to the devil? Oh, no. God is still under in, in authority. Now, remember when Paul said in Corinth, there's a man who had his father's wife. He had a, There was an immorality in Corinth that even the, the most immoral people in Corinth never dreamed of for good reasons, that he would have his father's wife. I'm sure most people never thought of that, okay? And Paul says, even though I am not there in person, in my spirit, I have already delivered such a one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of Christ Jesus. And so Paul said, I am praying that God allows this person to be tormented by the devil in his sin until he repents. And you know what? You read 2 Corinthians, and the guy repented. It's amazing. Listen to me. Never give up on someone who a Christian who's living in sin. I have seen so many Christians in outright, absolute rebellion against God, living like the devil. And here's what we always do, and we completely miss out on a very important ministry God wants us to have. We say they must not have been saved to begin with. Not true. I'm not saying all the people who make a profession of faith and later go into, into wickedness are, are saved. I'm not saying they are. God looks at the heart. I'm not going to tell you who's saved and who's not. But I am saying this. Paul didn't say that person must not be saved. He didn't say that. He said that person needs to get beat up by the devil for a little while. And then he can have a chance to repent. And he did. He did. That was God's mercy. Do you know, very often we as parents will allow our children to have some negative consequences for a while for their sin, for their disobedience, so that they'll straighten out. We, have we ever given our children negative consequences? We do. And God is the same way. So the Bible says, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespass. Do you see how our problem is the heart? Remember I preached a series on the heart? couple months ago. And you remember what I said your heart is? Your heart is your desires. Do you know every single one of us in our heart? Because our hearts are wicked, right? The Bible says out of the heart comes all the wickedness, right? Our desires are wicked because we have a sin nature. And do you know what every single one of us is in our heart? A desire to receive mercy but not give it. A desire to receive mercy but not give it. We want God to give us mercy. We want other people to give us mercy. But we don't want to offer it to someone else. And Jesus says it doesn't work like that. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. If we want God to have mercy on us, and I don't know about you, but boy, I need God to give me mercy every day. Hey, it's because I'm a pastor. <laughs> oh, well, I don't really have any problems, so I don't need any mercy. Oh, I need mercy every day. I mess up every day. I have problems every day. I get struggle every day. I get confused every day. We all need the mercy of God. And so I need to be so careful that I don't look at church members or relatives or family members and point a finger at them and go, Oh, God, that person's really bad. Oh, you are a terrible person. Oh, I can't have anything to do with yours. You're so different. I can't do that to those people because I have sin and I have problems in my own life and I need God to give me mercy. Again, if I'm in a position of authority over that person, I need to make sure I administer justice. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the vast majority of situations where we don't want to offer someone mercy. We don't have any authority over them. We have no ability to control anything that they do. And we need to give them mercy because God has given us mercy. But he says, if ye from your hearts Forgive not everyone his brother the trespass. Listen, the problem with unforgiveness is in our heart, isn't it? The problem with not wanting to give mercy is in our heart. And in our heart, and this is so true of all of us, in our heart, we want the lightest sentence for ourselves if we do something wrong. 
and we want to throw the book at anybody else that does something wrong. That's our heart. And he said, if you don't forgive your brother from your heart, your trespasses. So, well, how do I change my heart? You can change your heart. We talked about that in the series about the heart. Hear thou my son and be wise and guide thine heart in the way. What I need to do is understand what God says is what I should desire. And then I can choose to make that my desire. I can say, okay, God, you know what I see here? I'm desiring for that person to suffer because they've done wrong. That's my desire. But I did wrong, and Jesus suffered for me, and I got off free. So now what I should desire for that person is that they would receive that same mercy and that same forgiveness that I receive. That's a heart thing, isn't it? That I change and I stop desiring bad things to happen to people who I think are doing wrong and instead I desire that they would receive mercy the same mercy that I received Jesus says you want mercy you have to offer mercy to other people or you will not receive mercy blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy you can see how a merciful person would be happy could, can't you because, I don't know about you, but if you always suffer the consequences of everything you do wrong, you're not going to be very happy because you do a lot of wrong things, and I do too. You're not going to be very happy. But if you get forgiveness, and then God overlooks things, and God doesn't let you experience all the consequences, you go, wow, isn't God good? Well, he didn't give me what I deserve. And now you're so thankful. Now you're happy. But you're not happy because you're like, I'm such a great person. You're happy because you're like, I'm not such a great person. And God blessed me anyway. Do you see that's a whole other kind of happiness? You know, I'm ashamed to say that I think it's true for all of us. We think happiness is feeling good about ourselves, feeling like we're a good person. We think that's happiness. But actually, real happiness is when we're grateful that even though we're not a good person, God still blessed us. That's amazing. Who do you think would be happier? A person driving down the road who'd never been to prison? Or a person driving down the road who just got out? <laughs> Who's happier? The person who just got out. The person who's driving down the road, they're probably in a bad mood because somebody cut them off a while back. <laughs> and then you have a guy who just got out of prison. He's like, free! And somebody cuts him off, and he's like, wow, I haven't had anybody cut me off in 10 years. <laughs> wow, I'm so excited. He's appreciating it all so more. Hey, listen, we need to appreciate the forgiveness and the mercy of God. But you will be so happy if you say, I don't deserve the wife that God gave me. I don't deserve the children God gave me. I don't deserve the church that God gave me. I don't deserve the car that God gave me. I don't deserve the house God gave me. I don't deserve the job God gave me. I don't deserve the health that God gave me. But he gave it to me anyway. And then you go, I want to go show that mercy to someone else. Give someone else something they don't deserve. Why are the merciful happy? Because they're getting mercy. Because they're showing mercy. God's love is unconditional. His blessings are not. And his mercy are only for those who show mercy. You are to administer justice if you are the person in authority. But most of the time, the people that you're mad at, you're not in authority over them. And so most of the time, you are going to have to show them mercy. But before you show them mercy, you're going to have to stop and remember the mercy that Jesus Christ showed to you. The mercy that God showed to you. You want to be happy, show mercy. Other people, mercy. Father in heaven, how we all need to learn this lesson. Because we have that desire inside of us to get mercy, to plead for mercy, to beg for mercy. Every time we get caught, every time we get in trouble, we want to get off as easy as we can. But when we see somebody else doing something, we want them to get in trouble. We want them to suffer. Especially if what they did affected us. But you've shown us in your word that we will not be happy 
people who are always frustrated that other people didn't get what they deserve. They're miserable. They're not happy. Father, give us a desire to be blessed, to be happy. But help us to see that all the things we think will make us happy won't make us happy. Instead, what will make us happy is showing other people mercy. Because then you will continue to show mercy to us. Father, I pray that Dells Baptist Church would be a merciful church. And I pray that I would be a merciful pastor, a merciful husband, a merciful father. In Jesus' name, amen.